Well, welcome everyone to our first breakout session for day two of the virtual FLEX program reverse site visit. My name is Tracy Morton. I'm the Director of Population Health at the National Rural Health Resource Center, and I'm also the Program Manager for TAF. So thanks so much for being in this session today. So we'll be learning about fostering community engagement for improved health outcomes. So first I'll take a minute to orient you to the breakout room here in Zoom, and then um, introduce our speakers and the learning objectives for the session. So a little bit about how to navigate this room. Um, all the breakout sessions are being recorded. So if you're having a hard time choosing between going to one topic or another, know that you'll be able to listen to the playbacks. Playbacks from yesterday are already available in the portal. And the ones from today will continue to be uploaded on there. We'll also put the recordings onto the TAF website, which you'll be able to access at a later date as well. If you're having any technical difficulties, please just chat into the text, into the um, chat box. And myself or Andy Naslin from the center or else Jessica from Perform Media will see your message and we'll be able to help you out one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we really want your questions and interaction with the presenters. So for questions, again, please use that chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom browser. You can also raise your hand if you want to. So to do that, um, you would click on participants, which is in the bottom ribbon of your Zoom browser. And then from there, you'll be able to select an icon on the right side that says to raise hand. And that way we'll we'll see that as well too. Um, yeah. So I have it on my calendar. I if you're not speaking, we ask that you do mute your um, microphones right now. And, but if you do have a question, we certainly encourage you to ask that as well too. Again, we want these to be interactive. Um, so I will uh, tell you a little bit about what this session's intentions are for your learning, and then introduce the four speakers. So at the conclusion of this session, we hope that you'll be able to interpret how the Arizona Center for Rural Health leveraged federal grant funds and what their process was for forming the Weaver Mountains Health Initiative. We'd hope that you'd be able to assemble local or regional organizations to improve healthcare access, and that you'd be able to replicate various state flex program or, or critical access hospital community projects and apply some current tools and resources to assist and encourage your CHs to undertake substantive community engagement efforts to address social determinants of health. So we've got four speakers in this session, so let me quickly introduce them to you. Um, Jill Bullock has over 25 years of experience working in healthcare. Jill's worked for the Arizona Rural Hospital Flexibility Program, or AZ Flex, since 2011, and as the Flex Coordinator since 2014. As Associate, Associate Director, Jill's responsible for managing program resources to fulfill the center's mission priorities. Jill has focused her attention to advance access and quality healthcare delivery programs in rural and underserved communities. Jill's joined in the room there today with Joyce Hospitar, who has worked for over 35 years for hospital systems in Utah, Kentucky, and Arizona, in the areas of strategic planning, marketing, and operations. Currently, Joyce is a senior advisor, rural programs at the Arizona Center for Rural Health, and her efforts focus on providing technical assistance to the state's rural hospitals and clinics, the statewide emergency medical services and trauma networks, which is currently focused on the four-year SAMHSA First Responders Initiative. Also joining the presenters today is Megan Lahr, who is a research fellow at the University of Minnesota's Rural Health Research Center, and she's a member of the FLEX monitoring team. Megan's research focuses um, in the FLEX monitoring, on, FLEX monitoring team on the quality of care and best practices for critical access hospitals, as well as quality measures, data analyses related to the MB Quip project. Um, she also has completed research in access to care for rural individuals, rural caregiving, and healthcare and support services for older adults in rural communities. And before she worked at the Rural Health Research Center, Medigan worked at the State Health Access Data Assistance Center on a variety of projects related to access, cost, quality, and health outcomes. And she spent several years working in federal policy for U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar. And then our last speaker for today is John Gale, who is a senior research associate for the Maine Rural Health Research Center. John's work focuses on rural system delivery, including rural health clinics, critical access hospitals, and mental health, substance use, primary care, and emergency medical services, as well as program outcome measurement and evaluation. John serves as a principal investigator for Maine's work on the Flex monitoring team and the Frontier Community Health Integration Program or Project Demonstration or the FCHIP demonstration. John's worked with CHS and Flex programs for over 20 years. Um, he serves on the Board of Trustees for the National Rural Health Association, and he chairs their policy congress, as well as the New England Rural Health Association Policy Committee. Um, and so with that, I will turn things over to Jill and Joyce to kick off our presentations today. All right, thank you very much for that 
Um, nice introduction, Tracy. Welcome, everybody. And uh, so Jill and I are going to sort of tag team on uh, covering uh, our project, or not project, but our effort around the state on fostering connections for healthy communities. And this one experience that we're going to share with you uh, is around Weber Mountain's health initiative experience. So with the next slide, Joe. So what we wanna cover is how we have at the Center for Rural Health really leveraged our resources from a variety of programs that I will discuss uh, on the next slide. And then Jill is gonna cover the sort of the profiling of the Weber Mountains and the history of the area because it's, it really is quite interesting uh, as we have learned over the past year of, of, of the community and issues there that they have, are facing. And then we have a timetable of uh, what has happened since um, the beginning of our connection to the Weaver Mountains uh, community. And then we open it to questions. Next slide. So this slide here um, covers uh, some of the projects that the Center for Rural Health has uh, funds from. And this sort of is seeding to how this effort with the Weaver Mountains has uh, processed over the, over the year. And for me, um, I'll just use my example here, is that under our FLEX program, along with the SOAR program, along with SAMHSA, our uh, first responder initiative, and what we're doing with the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. My efforts here at the center cover all of these projects, which has really seeded, uh, and it's such an interesting story that I'm so thrilled that we're here to, to share with you. So starting with the SAMHSA project, so this is a two and a half year project that we have, uh, to train all first responders in the state and provide Narcan. So we get requests from all the EMS uh, agencies around the state and we got one from People's Valley Fire, which is in the Weaver Mountains. And uh, so we sent them the Narcan. And then I get a call from the captain at People's Valley Fire and saying, thank you for the Narcan, but we really need healthcare. We don't have, we don't have our needs being met here in this community. So with that, um, I said, well, um, we can maybe help you here because one of our critical access hospitals is Wickenburg Community Hospital. So called up the CEO and said, look, people at People's Valley are really interested in talking to somebody that may be able to help them bring health care. So Jennifer Peters with the SOAR grant and I first went up to, um, to the SAMHSA, I mean to um, uh, meet some of the people at Weber Mountains. So it's this connection of what you'll see in the wheel when we get to that on how with all the work that we collectively do here at the center has been able to leverage our ability to really work with this group of, of now called the Weaver Mountains Health Initiative. So with that, Jill is now going to um, go into a little bit more about the Weaver Mountains. So this is a very small mountain range. As you can see, um, Mar Phoenix is in Maricopa County. So it's north of Maricopa County and a little bit west of Phoenix. And um, it's called People's Valley. It was founded in 1863. Um, there was a lot of, um, during the gold rush days, finding gold deposits and um, and to this day, there is some mining still going on. Most of it is, has um, closed, but there is still some mining going on. Um, and then after the gold rush, there, the population kept dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. But it, it's, there's no hotels in this area. Um, it's very remote and there's, it's a lovely, charming town. 
that has a lot of antique stores. And this woman, Frances, who is very involved in the project, lets us stay in her in her guest house and just, just feeds us and opens her arms and gives us wine and and, and you know we're part of her family now. So it's it's really fun just to drive up there and, and stay. And especially in the summer because it's about 10 degrees cooler than Tucson. So it's about a three hour drive from from where we are in Tucson, Arizona. So it's it's um it's a little bit of a haul and it's through beautiful mountains. So um, this is the community. They have a town of Kirkland, Peoples Valley, Skull Valley, Wilhoit, and Yarnell. Some of you might remember the name of Yarnell. Um, that was where the big fire was, where the 19 hotshots died. Um, what was that, seven years ago now? Um, that, that, was, that was the largest death of firefighters in the state of Arizona at one time. Um, it's it's 4,057 people within five communities. It's predominantly elderly. It's very low income as well. Um, the per capita income is 24,000 to 30,000 over the five communities. So um, a lot of Medicaid people, but have a very long distance to drive for any health care. And um, they don't have, they don't even have access to primary care. So they do have to drive either to Prescott um, which is about an hour, hour or Wickenburg, which is not quite an hour, but, but almost an hour away for any, any of their primary care. Um, so here on your right is a picture of the 19 hot shots that were killed during the fire. And it's very, still very devastating to the community. Um, it, it just, this, this community is still trying to heal from, from the fire uh, and from, from the deaths of the firefighters. Um, they, have, they built a memorial where the site was, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner. There was actually a movie made, um, Only the Brave, the Yarnell Fire. Um, and with this, this kind of Weaver Mountain Health Initiative, it's really bringing this community back together. They're all working together and trying to bring services to everybody in the community. Next slide. So this is a busy slide, I know, but this is really outlining all that has happened since February of 2019, when I got the call from um, Scott Mayer, the captain of People's Valley, and saying, look, we really need help. And so the first meeting, as I said before, we called Wickenburg Community Hospital, and they are totally committed to this effort. And so we had our first meeting. It was really fantastic. They had representation from the firehouses, from the school, the elementary school, the principal. And so it really sort of laid the groundwork of what we were going to do. And so in May, because through the conversation from March to April, um, the FLEX program had dollars that we were able to give to Wickenburg to uh, fund a community health needs assessment. And what was so exciting about this is that at this time through uh, early May to June, the, the firehouses uh, in those little communities go up to every house to um, assess what fire damage, damage there might be in that house uh, to their property. So the, so the fire EMS personnel took the survey and because a lot of these people live way in the mountains, they don't come out very often. And they were able to collect data on the needs, how much you travel for healthcare, what do you think of your healthcare? So having the EMS personnel help us sort of initiate our needs assessment was just really tremendous. So with that, through June, they formalized, named uh, the we we Weaver Mountains Health Initiative. So lo looking across and going down the, um, the wheel here, the other thing that came about was that one of our uh, statewide foundations called Vitalist Health Foundation had an opportunity 
for organizations to apply for what's called the Live Well Arizona Incubator. Well, it turns out that, that the Weaver Mountains Health Initiative was selected for that, and they got a coach that could help them really get their community together, and it lasted 18 months. They got some dollars, and so the fact that from February to July, they were able, that they had formed this organization along with doing the needs assessment through FLEX, things were really, really moving along. So now you, you move down through last summer, uh, the analysis was complete, it was presented to the community. Um, the, in September, the Live Well Incubator was uh, released uh, statewide on what they were doing. There were five organizations that were selected. And then um, through, the, through the sort of the winter time, the, because of what was uh, formed out of the, the vitalist effort, the incubator, they were able to really identify their goals and objectives. So that's really the seed of what really happened. And then now here in um, March, they now have a formal board. And on the earlier slide of where, how we're connected at the center with uh, an organization called the Arizona Center, uh, um, the Coalition for Military. Arizona Co Coalition for Military Families, we received along with them a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona to work with um, to work with us on um, veterans suicide. Um, yeah, on veterans uh, suicide, and it turns out that with that connection, now the Weaver Mountains Health Initiative is now part of the Together with Veterans Opportunity, which is a two to three year effort to focus in on suicide. So, so the center's connection to the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, our introduction of what we're doing in Weaver Mountains, and there are many uh, veterans that live there they are now in this three-year effort with uh, the national program of to get together with veterans. So now here we are currently, um, they've got their 501c3 status. Wickenburg Community Hospital is working with each of the three fire districts to develop a, um, um, an MOU so that they can have consistent training. So that's where, uh, Wickenburg is still totally involved, and uh, it's just um, a story that we just really had to share. So uh, we're so excited on how um, we have progressed with them. Um, we're there to support them going forward, uh, and they're looking to open a clinic. Uh, they're bringing telemedicine in. They're going after, perhaps with Wickenburg, a uh, a mobile van to bring to bring healthcare there. So this is just the start of the story, if you will. Um, so with that, um, I think we're done. I think what we'll do maybe is move on to the next speaker, and then we can um, maybe field all questions at the end, if that's okay. I don't see anything right now in the chat box. John, are you able to to kick it off? Yeah, I was going to say, did you uh, you you have our slides? Or you need me to share my screen. It's probably uh, if you want to share your screen and click through, that'd be great. And then I'll I can share mine when I'm up. Okay, um, let me pull up the slides. Great. So I'll move through my section pretty quickly. So I want to make sure that Megan has some time and and that we have some room for questions. So our session today is really about focus is focusing on community engagement for improved health outcomes and we've been doing a lot of work over the years on the flex monitoring team with community community engagement community benefit needs assessments and it's an important element and what i'm going to do is talk to you a little bit differently about community engagement so this is mentioned so we all have two pieces today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about challenges to developing community engagement and where community engagement fits in the current environment with rural hospital closures and COVID-19. 
and then Megan will talk to you about a project they've done on the social determinants of health. So here are the challenges that we face in rural areas. We know that many ha uh, CAHs and rural hospitals are at risk for closure. And I think COVID-19 is just exacerbating that problem. We will eventually emerge from the current pandemic. And I suspect that many of our hospitals are going to be in significantly weakened financial states. So community support and utilization is important. And one of the things that I've seen as I, I've worked with communities over the years is that when you walk into a community where the hospital has closed or is at risk for closure, there's a real disconnect between community use of the hospital and support for it. So one of the things, we're, some of the things that we're seeing is that we have a loss of population. Two times as many rural community, rural counties, excuse me, in recent years have lost population compared to those that have gained. And that in 76% of patients, there was a six state study done recently, 76% of patients in rural counties with a local hospital left the community for care. And that's compared to a much lower percentage for suburban and urban areas. And among the people who left for, uh, for care, 68% of those folks left for a lower acuity condition that could be easily addressed in the local hospital. So I think, again, this to me suggests this disconnect. And when you talk to rural community leaders about saving the hospital and the loss of local jobs, they don't seem to make the connection between use of the hospital and support for the hospital and being able to save it. it we tend to treat rural hospitals as, oh, a utility or much the way we look at the post office and assume that it's always going to be there. So community engagement, I think, is a part of a planning uh, process and a way of gathering information is critical. What we want to know is what are the reasons for our migration? Is it concerns about quality? Is it confidentiality? Is it cost? Services not available? Other? Can the community, can the CH do anything to reverse out migration? This is critical. We can do all the financing strategies we like. We can develop new models of care. But if the community member, if community members don't use the service, it's not going to be sustainable. So what are the services that are needed? What services will they use? And is there any willingness to support the hospital financially? So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about a project that I've tracked for a while. And I, I just like the foundation of this work with the uh, Washington State Hospital Association. They were looking at their vulnerable hospitals. And they really identify community engagement as a process of working collaborative, collaboratively with partners and community members to address the issues in the community. Um, it's a process to build support and plan for the future. And it involves partnerships that can be aimed at improving population health. And it requires a dialogue, you know, it requires people to talk about what they want and what they'll do. And it has to be done organically and it has to be done with some sincerity. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the whole process was designed to create a comprehensive local community assessment, planning and system development tool. Uh, and they, they did a lot of work with this. And this is a, um, a graphic that they produced that I really like. You had, they called it uh, you know, supporting the big blue H and we've all seen the sign in rural communities and about with signs pointing to the hospital. So there are three strategies. They look at staff and board as ambassadors. They have a community engagement strategy and strong uh, strategy and strong partnerships. And the goal and, and what they've found and what I, I have seen is that it builds better community health. It can align the community with new payment incentives. It provides buy-in to the hospital and its services. And it can increase utilization of services. I think this is the big thing. We can, unless, if you walk into many rural communities where a hospital is closing, they might have one or two patients a day. And that is not a sustainable model. And it's not, the policy environment is such now that it's unlikely that we're going to continue to throw money at hospitals um, without thinking about how the community uses the, the services and the facilities. So why do it? It's healthcare of the future is, is patient and community engaged. 
it's an, an integral part of the mission. There are, I believe, economic benefits. And I think more importantly is the best defense is a good offense. Get out and talk to folks and understand what's going on. And I think to the extent that you can build community engagement into some of the uh, programs that you're doing in program area three and, and perhaps even two, it, it's really important. So I'll go back to some key themes as we've worked with communities and we've done this for years. Trust is important. It's built during the information and gathering stage. Uh, the outcomes and the process has to be transparent. And I think it's important to understand that simply uh, seeking to understand the lack of support for a hospital solely to overcome it uh, doesn't really engender trust. I don't know how many times when we've been to communities and you want to talk to them about their engagement strategies, they talk about the same folks, the people who belong to the Kiwanis, to the Rotary, the local board members who are bankers or ranchers, and lo and behold, they tend to look a lot like us. And then they express concern that, that different vulnerable populations, maybe with different language issues or culture, really don't seem to reach out to them. So I think that has to be a process really of sincerity. And it should seek to understand what the community wants and find a way to address those concerns, values, and priorities. And understand that enthusiasm for community engagement may not be as, as easily translated into meaningful engagement in practice. This is hard work. And it requires hospitals to be a little more open. It requires them to be a bit more vulnerable. Uh, they may hear some things that they don't want to. I think it's important for community members to understand the economic realities of their hospital. Um, I can tell you that I've spoken with board members at Royal Hospital and they don't use their hospital. Their arguments are that, you know, I'm, the board, board, I'm on the board, everyone knows me, there's a lack of privacy, uh, confidentiality. But if your own board members won't use your hospital, why would you expect anyone else to? So finally, um, and then I'll turn it over to Megan, there really is no monolithic community. Um, you really need to dig in and understand it. They've got to understand what the patterns are related to use of support. How widespread is the use, is the lack of support? Understand who uses the hospital or doesn't use it. And what level of support is there in, among community organizations, business, government, schools? And then finally, really reach out to engage a wide range of participants. And I think that it's important to do this in a way that has some validity. So if I'm a older white man walking into uh, um, a culture and a community that's very different, they may be immigrants, they may be refugees from another area, I don't have necessarily, as sincere as I might be, they may not necessarily have the, um, the trust and the, under, uh, the, I don't have the trust and the understanding of these folks. So maybe find someone from that community that can be part of that discussion. So I will now um, turn it over to Megan and we'll be available for questions when we're done. John, if you actually want to stop sharing, then I can I can run the slide for mine if that works for you. Absolutely. There you go. Thank you so much. And uh, as John said, um, I'm Megan Meyer, also with the Flex Monitoring Team. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project um, that we worked on um, in the past year um, related to social determinants and health initiatives at critical access hospitals. So very basically, social determinants of health, um, you know, this is a lot of what uh, Dr. James talked about yesterday. Um, these circumstances which people grew up in, live, work, and age, um, and, and these systems as well. Um, and that clinical care really only accounts for uh, about 20% of social determinants, and the rest is accounted for by social, economic, health behaviors, um, and physical environment. Um, so a little bit about what the project that we worked on, uh, we reached out to, to a lot of you, uh, to the flex coordinators um, for names uh, of critical access hospitals that were working on social determinants programs. Um, and then uh, we reached out to those hospitals um, and surveyed them. Um, afterwards, we selected some um, that had, had some strong programs and did interviews with um, about 14 different um, cause. 
And then um, we are working on right now doing case studies of two of those um, to talk a little bit more in depth about the best practices of the initiatives that they have going on. Um, so we're still working on that, but a little bit about um, the initiatives that we saw going on in critical access hospitals. Um, this talks about the different topics um, that those initiatives have, and obviously um, food insecurity was something that many of them were working to address. Um, that was really above and beyond all the other topics that came up. Um, but also not surprising things um, like health literacy. I think this was a pretty general um, topic um, that folks mentioned. Um, transportation, you know, that's always an issue in a lot of rural communities. Um, and then mental and behavioral health, housing, early childhood education, um, and several others as well. Um, so what so what we got from um, a lot of the interviews uh, really broke it down into kind of some barriers um, that hospitals um, in, in, you know, initiating and developing these programs, um, and then some facilitators as well. Um, and especially in this section, um, the, the model that John just showed with that big blue H, a lot of those components fit into either the barriers or facilitators, kind of what helped um, these hospitals to develop their programs. And so um, for barriers first, I think uh, developing and maintaining partnerships in their communities, um, this was a really big barrier. And so trying to get their foot in the door um, trying to work with um, community organizations um, in order to not duplicate the work that they're doing, but for the hospital to get in there um, and create these partnerships to really um, develop initiatives that would work best for the community overall. Um, maintaining funding um, is something uh, that, that a lot of folks know um, uh, is really important for critical hospitals um, to, to fund these initiatives. Um, not many of them mentioned that they had flex funding, and so that's um, possibly an area for um, improvement in the future. Um, a lot of them said, you know, we, we get seed funding, um, all of the initiatives of the 14 people that we talked to, um, all of them had funding from the hospitals, um, but that was something that the hospitals made the conscious decision to fund. Um, and so they, the hospitals are always looking for additional funds, grant funds, um, ways to keep funding these programs as they became more and more um, important to the communities and they were surveying. Um, and then along with kind of maintaining these partnerships, it was also about um, engaging participants. And so trying to get the people in the community on board, um, like John said, engaging them, um, seeing what their needs were, not just what the hospital thought their needs were. Um, and a lot of times, um, came after uh, community health needs assessments um, and that was kind of the way they figured out um, what do we need to address in our community. Um, as well as facilitators, uh, strong leadership was really uh, something that was important um, and so whether this was the CEO or the boards, um, usually you heard a lot of both, um, but you needed, you needed um, that leadership um, for folks to be able to um, engage in these programs that to initiate them and as well as to maintain them over time. Um, having, you know, that CEO on board who makes all the decisions related to um, things like staffing and funding um, was really important, but also someone who is seen as a leader in the community um, was really important. And then partnerships. Um, obviously, you see it's here under barriers and facilitators, um, but, but a lot of the folks are saying, you know, yes, it is difficult to develop these relationships um, in the community, but once you have those, um, those partners are essential to um, getting these initiatives to work. Um, and so thinking about the community partners, these are um, examples of community partners. Um, I think almost all of the initiatives, um, the folks from initiatives that we spoke with had multiple community partners. Um, and so this is really interesting to see. Um, obviously schools, food banks, and local government were at the top here, um, but I think a very wide range of different community partners, um, just depending on what the initiatives look like. Um, so another component we asked about was advice, um, you know, what advice would you have for other critical access hospitals that are looking to do kind of a similar initiative? Um, one big component was ensuring ample staffing. Um, that's something I know that all of you um, probably hear a lot about from your critical access hospitals in your state. Um, you know, a lot of folks at CAUSE, um, they wear a lot of hats. And so being able to dedicate um, staff time to these initiatives was really, um, really important. Um, again, the advice was to have uh, strong and engaged community partnerships. Um, here's a quote from uh, one of the guys that said, you know, find the strong partner in the community. Hospitals can't do everything, um, which we all know as well. Um, and especially these small hospitals are limited in their bandwidth. Um, and so, um, you know, find those partners that are really going to help contribute and stay involved in the initiatives. Um, and then again, um, the call leadership. 
um, th this quote really um, was, was really helpful in kind of understanding what's going on, but it's been a sigh of relief from the community of hospitals taking this on um, as an evidence-based way in comprehensive way. Um, and so just kind of, again, reiterating that, that leadership of the hospital. Um, so yes, the, the CEOs and the folks there, but also um, hospital as an entity um, leading some of these initiatives was, was really important. Um, so on to best practices. Like I said, um, right now we're looking, um, we're working on case studies for two of the Texas hospitals that we interviewed, um, and here they are, Northeastern Regional Hospital. Um, we actually are just wrapping up the interviews with those folks, um, which were really, really exciting. Um, and then we are working on setting up something with um, Lakewood Health System in Minnesota. Um, and so those initiatives, um, it's been really great to kind of work with them and learn about them. And we're excited um, probably later this fall to have this, um, these case studies out to really identify the best practices um, and hopefully be a good resource for all of you to use and share with your cause um, as well. That is all. I'll leave it up for questions. Hey, thanks to all the presenters. It looked like there was a question that was just in the chat box. Um, from Stephen in Missouri, who is asking Megan, um, are the hospitals utilizing their electronic health, health records to collect their social determinants of health data or Z codes through their coding process? Yeah, we did. Uh, oops, sorry, we didn't get into that um, too specifically, um, but in a couple of instances, we did hear folks that mentioned that. Um, some were talking about it, especially um, in food insecurity. That was one place that we heard a lot about it. That folks um, during clinic. Um, would would hear about food insecurity issues they would screen for it and that would be something um, in their EHRs and so um, I think that was the biggest example of EHRs. We didn't across the board ask that as a question but that was an example. Yeah we were just um, organizationally working with a hospital group in, Minas in Minnesota I believe and they have access to some data like that too so they've been pooling information about food insecurity and have a recent larger influx of an immigrant population into the area. And so they want to marry those things together to actually to streamline care coordination with that population. Um, but then to John's point before, that trust and understanding and having the right um, kind of in with certain groups, whether it's existing partners that have been around for decades and maybe there's some competition that exists there or there are or there new groups and new relationships that trust partners so incredibly important to get any kind of traction at all. Um, there's another question in the chat from Holly, um, Holly Mills in Utah, and she's wondering what role do state flex programs play in working with their CHs and these kind of social determinants of health type projects? Yeah, on the projects that we worked on specifically, um, there wasn't a lot that we heard about. Um, and I think that we, might be an area for, for um, further engagement or, you know, we, we are obviously really grateful um, so many of the state flex programs and coordinators were able to provide us with information for the hospitals that they were working on these initiatives. Um, and so obviously there's some awareness there of what was going on. Um, I think only one of them um, mentioned when we asked this each of our interviews, but that they had funding from the flex program. And so it was a part of, of the work that the, um, their office was working, their state office was working on. Um, and so other than that, there wasn't a lot of, of work directly um, that they told us about um, for the initiatives for the 14 that we Okay, great. And, and another question, um, did you develop, have any new models been developed or ideas for addressing food insecurities beyond the food pantry? Because I guess anyone in the group heard anything about that, um, or maybe Megan and John have too. Start just briefly. The, the program that we're talking with in Minnesota, um, they, they've done several things. Theirs is um, kind of a food pantry, but it's a food pharmacy. And so um, based on these clinic, uh, clinic uh, visits, um, folks can be prescribed and be, become part of a program um, to receive food on I believe it's a monthly basis. Um, but they've also developed a few other programs um, as a part of this initiative. One is um, delivering food to a, a senior housing community here in the area. Um, and so they're able to work um, and do that, I believe, on a monthly basis as well. Um, and then they have a few other um, smaller programs working with uh, local farmers markets, so folks can get credit to go to the farmers market and shop with, uh, I don't know if it's some sort of token, I believe. Um, and so that was another part. So they have a lot of different kind of food access programs as a part of their one um, overall initiative in this example. 
And it's on a smaller scale. We've seen work with just community gardens, um, programs helping folks with food insecurity understand how to cook and use some of the local products. It's very seasonal. Um, so there's a lot that they can do. Um, and, and much of this, a lot of the, this type of work falls under their community benefit strategies and population health strategies. So, so some of it's really just thinking about what role and where the hospital can legitimately have some influence. Interesting, I was just thinking about some of the experiences that we've had locally here with, you know, with the schools all going to distance learning and then we had our local buses out delivering food into the neighborhoods too. That's never happened ever before. And so something like that too is just, as a model, I think for facilities and communities to consider going forward too about meet, meeting those people that, you know, need assistance kind of where they're at too, with a, a different kind of delivery model. Yeah, and if, if I can just add there with what's happening at the Weaver Mountains, they do have volunteers with their uh, uh, Meals on Wheels. And so they're able to go as they are delivering these meals, can talk to the people and really seek out what issues they have about just food access. And that's what's so interesting in that community with the EMS personnel being called for whatever, because they're the only ones there right now that deal with all of this. So they're really, they're, they're constantly focusing in on these social determinants because this is what the population is going through there and why the need for, the, for, for bringing healthcare needs there. So the mobile clinic, um, maybe getting you know, the consistency of, of training of the EMS personnel because they're the only ones there now. So there's a lot of movement through Wickerberg Community Hospital, which is about 40, 40 miles, is it 30, 30, 40 miles, about 30 miles from um, sort of center of Darnell. And um, so it, it's just interesting, you know, in hearing the very good presentation on the, the opposite side of what we presented of this community coming together their commitment of bringing, bringing services to the community. So I just wanted to add that. So, thank you. You know, I, I- Go ahead, John, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say over the years, um, state flex programs have engaged, uh, worked with community engagement to different levels. So now we have a lot of work around um, community health needs assessments and supporting them. I know Montana has done a lot of work uh, with that, with the assessments and engagement over the years. But I think it's really an important part to, to help hospitals think about this more so than just, community engagement is more than just trying to find out what services we can sell to the community. It needs, that trust needs to be cultivated and developed and it needs to be cultivated. It doesn't last without careful careful cultivation because it's very easy to lose that. So thinking about that and then, then applying that to some of the things that we've talked about in terms of population health and social determinants, um, what can the hospital do? What role can they play? Where does it fit in their mission? And how can they engage other people in solving the problem? So I, I think it does, addressing some of these needs provides the hospital with a fair amount of legitimacy and that's how you, that's how they can develop that trust. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so there's one more question in the chat that I think is relevant to um, Arizona. So I'll pose that and we're, we're at the end of our time. Uh, Megan and John, if you can look at the chat box, there's a question about a definition for in food insecurity. So if you could type in there kind of what you're referring to, if you, if you have a spe specific definition you've been using. Also a neat um, comment from Alia in New Hampshire about how they're using heat mapping, which is of course great and I know Stephen Agenda has been doing a lot of that work in Missouri too. Um, but the question from Kyle in Wyoming directed to Arizona is just kind of what's hope for, hope for the future growth of your program there? What, what comes next? For the people, for the Weaver Mountains Health Initiative? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, uh, well, several things. I mean, uh, the, the, the fact that that community of five, five towns, if you will, small, they are committed to bring healthcare there. 
as an example, the elementary school has land and they are willing to donate this land to build a clinic. So Wickenburg Community Hospital and their consultant are looking into a mobile clinic that can then be placed maybe on, on the grounds of the, of, of the school or there's other that they're seeking out local people to maybe invest in building a clinic. Uh, so there, there is a lot and the commitment is there. This whole thing that with the, together with veterans of uh, focusing on suicide, <clears throat> that in itself is, is, is just really going to support that community and really let everybody know that, that they really need healthcare and so we really feel that they're, they're, they're primed to keep it up. And as Jill mentioned, you know, the, the whole thing with the Yarnell fire, it, it's fascinating to be in these meetings and to be with the people who, you know, lost loved ones or whatever, but it's, it's taking time. But we, we see this process through the year on what has happened and the commitment that they are getting not only from the Center for Rural Health because we are committed, as well as Wickenburg, uh, the medical staff at Wickenburg. So it, it's just, I think, a great question, and we are we are very positive. This is going to just continue to move, and um, and it's a it's a organic, uh, and it really has given me personal pleasure in my 20 plus years here. To be on a project like this where it's that the people are saying, we need this, help us. So, and they're getting it done. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I think that's a great way to close the session too. So thank you very much for all of our speakers for sharing your stories today, sharing the information you've gathered out in the field. I think we got some great tips and good ideas as well. So thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, if you're sticking around for the final session for the reverse site visit today, you actually don't need to leave this link. Um, it'll be occurring in the same exact Zoom room. Um, we'll reconvene for that small group discussion again, kind of a similar structure to yesterday, but a little bit different. Um, we'll start again at 1.20 p.m. Central Time. And we'll be talking about technical assistance strategies to, to support system affiliated critical access hospitals. So if you need to step away or you end up losing your connection, you can always reconnect back in through the portal. Um, but if you want to, you can just uh, turn off your camera, mute your microphone, step away for a minute, and we'll start again in the same exact room at 1.20. Thank you, everybody.